Uh, there's been a, f a fair bit of stuff that has changed in the industry of late. So I thought I'd do this little video and sort of bang this together and give you some updates of what's happened and what's changed. Because there's been a bit, um, there's been some manual of standards updates. There's been some changes to the way our flight schools do things. There's been some, the BV loss stuff's uh, out and about. So here's a list of topics that this video will cover uh, and we'll go from there. All right, let's get straight into it. Some, some changes of late, tethered operations and indoor operations. So to give you some quick background, on your remote operator certificate, there was a restriction that prevented you from taking off within three nautical miles of a controlled aerodrome, full stop. So it didn't matter if you were indoors or tethered up or whatever you were doing, the REOC, not the manual of standards or the regulations, but the REOC said, you couldn't take off full stop and you had to abide by that condition. So now CASA are allowing you to remove that from your REOC uh, by, by emailing them in and saying, hey, I'd like a new copy of the REOC without the restrictions for uh, being able to fly indoors and tethered. And they will reissue your REOC and they'll take away those clauses. Now, a couple of things, indoor operations is fine. You can fly indoors within three nautical miles of that control aerodrome, that's fine, no one cares. Excellent. And make sure you look up what indoors means, right? It means the drone can't get out, so that's cool. The bit about tethering though, in the manual of standards, if you remember, they put a whole bunch of stuff about allowing tethered operations. Well, uh, that's still there, but the REOC prevented you from doing it, right? So now, if you uh, you can apply to CASA um, and say, I would like to be able to fly blanket approval within three nautical miles of controlled aerodromes while my drone is tethered, you can do that. You'll have to apply to CASA, they'll wanna see all of your practices and procedures around tethering and how you do it, and there's, there's guidance in the manual of standards for that. And then they will issue you an instrument that will that will give you blanket approval for the length of that REOC, so it'll expire when your REOC expires and then you renew, um, that will allow you to put a drone up within three nautical miles of a controlled aerodrome as long as you're tethered and you know, you've, you've got to follow your procedures and follow the, the, the requirements in the MOS. There are some technicalities. It's, yeah, I won't go into crazy detail because we train this in the, in, the, in the training course, but it's all about height in reference to the aerodrome's elevation. And if you guys want me to do a separate video on this alone, let me know and I'll do it. But anyway, it's all in the manual standard. So that's out and about now. You can go and apply for that and take that bit off your REOC and go do tethered operations. Do I agree with tethered operations and attaching strings to drones? And ooh, it's a whole nother topic for discussion, but we'll get to that later. Medium sized. Uh, drones have now us training schools have the ability to endorse you on a medium size aircraft so you know agris t30 t40 xag p100 as you know we are the the only nationally recognized training organization for xag uh, at the moment and as we speak now it's it's july 2023 um we can now sign you off on those things uh we've got xag machines we've got all of the xag machines including the p100 and the soon to come p100 pro uh, the T30 and T40 from DJI, and the T50 will come at some point, but it's on hold, but anyway. So you can now get that done with flight schools who have been endorsed by CASA to do it. Your flight school needs to apply, and anyway, well, we can do that for you. So if you're looking for medium categories, let us know, get in contact. All the contact details are all over this page, uh, and you can get, it, get hold of us, cool. Um, Military airport, so CASA opened up, wow. So you remember how we've got this, uh, for those that may not know, we've got automated uh, airspace approvals around Canberra, Adelaide and Perth still currently. You can go log on and get an automated approval and away you go. But the military was always a problem. Now again, in regulation it was written that if you wanted to take off and fly within three nautical miles of any controlled aerodrome, your REOC said, got to get CASA approval. And the regulation said, got to get CASA approval. But sometimes you're dealing direct with the military. So. There is an instrument out, it's CASA 23 slash 23. If you look it up, I'm reading my notes here in front of me, CASA 23 slash 23, look it up. If you adopt that into your manuals and follow those procedures, you can deal direct with the military controlled aerodrome. So for example, Richmond in Sydney, no longer do you need to apply for an area approval within three nautical miles of that aerodrome, you would go to CASA, you would go to the military for it, not CASA. You still need to apply for approval, but not an area approval from CASA. Hope that makes sense. Follow the procedures in the in that 2323 and you'll be good to go. We're getting through them. All the links and all this sort of stuff I'll put in the descriptions. So they'll be there. The BV loss exam has hit. Holy moly, this has been an epic adventure. 
To fly BV loss in uh, in Australia with your drone, you needed to go and do an IREX course at, up until just recently. And for those that don't know, the IREX is an instrument rating from the aircraft. It's probably not overly relevant to drones at, at all, but it was all we had. Now the, the, uh, the, the table has turned. We have a BV loss exam. Now the exam is not run by us flight schools. The exam is actually administered by a separate independent body. So. Uh, we don't run the exams. We can train you through the material, and there's a little bit of material to get through. CASA have a, a whole range of uh, knowledge standards that we have to train you to. And then you book yourself into exam. It's $160, I think, don't quote me on it, uh, and sit the exam independently from us. Um, so our course is about to land. We're just putting the finishing touches on it. We actually wanted to see, I know flight schools went and launched courses already, um, but we wanted to see the exam before we released our material because I want to make sure that our material meets the criteria of the exam 100% and we're not sending students off into a sort of a, a wild goose chase so to speak. Um, that exam has landed now so we will have our course soon. You'll still now just just on this a lot of people had a misconception that you could go and sit this exam and then run off and do BB loss uh, operations and that's not the case. You It just removes the need for IREX. You will still need to put an application into CASA to perform your BV loss operation at the particular location you want to do it and whatever it is the operation you're going to do. And that has to go through the normal process with you know the SOAR and all the rest of it. And then they'll give you the approval instrument to go and do what it is you've asked them to do. You cannot simply sit this course and then go do BV loss stuff. It doesn't work that way. While we're on the topic of BV loss slash EV loss, EV loss has had a change not that long ago where um, Class one and class two, both of them no longer need, well, it was only class two that needed it, but no, no longer the need for IREX or BV loss examination pass. So class one and class two, the, 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 the need for BV loss, EV loss has been completely removed. Uh, sorry, BV loss, IREX, I should say, has been completely removed. So um, you can you know, knock yourself out. Now, just remember that the, IRE, the uh, EV loss class one, the spotter stands next to you. If you want to fly under goggles, that's class one. You've got to have an observer next to you. In class two, you can put forward observers out there in the field and get further distances with radio comms. If you need information on any of that, hit us up. We can help you with those applications. Oh, we're getting through it. Um, all the flight, all us flight schools had an update recently in the MOS. Um, it wasn't a great deal of, uh, of stuff that would really affect the end user, but things like they tidied up um, contact time was one. We, we as flight schools can't use revision as part of our minimum 15 hours contact time. So, you know, if you've looked at your time you're spending with your flight school and you got say 15 and a half hours of theory time with them, excluding examinations and excluding all the other stuff, um, just the REPL course, if you got say 16 hours with them and three hours of that on the last day was revision, then they're not operating in accordance with the MOS and our new changes, right? Um, the new changes make it so that the 15 hours is purely training no revision now we do much more than that anyways anyone who's come on our course will know we're a full five day course still so there's four days of theory and exam and recap so three days alone three full days is theory alone so you know roughly seven hours a day we're doing 21 hours of theory alone before we go into any sort of recap and that doesn't include the radio operator certificate because that's done separately as well that three full days is purely rep theory so you're getting your value for money. Um, you know, we there's a lot of content to, to get through and some of it's technical and we get bogged down a little bit with lots of questions. So the more time we can we can pack into this week, I think, the better. You're not trying to cram it in so hard. I don't know how you can do a full REPL course with only two days of all the theory. I just, you'd have to self-study your head off and that's not quality in my books. But anyway, that's just my opinion. Um, night operations, I want to touch on this because I've been fielding a lot of emails and calls over the past few months and I want to sort of set the record straight. There is no such thing as a night operations endorsement. Let's get that straight. Doesn't exist. There's no CASA fees you need to pay for it. There's no form you've got to fill in. Let me explain how night ops happens. When you get a REOC, um, you, you, part of the REOC is the ability to fly a drone at night as long as you follow the procedures set out in those REOC manuals. And they are, um, I won't go into all the details because they're in the manuals, but they are things like you've got to do, you've got to, all of your pilots, either yourself and or your pilots have to be trained uh, to do that. Now the training, and this is, this is where it's getting confusing, the training doesn't get done by a flight school. 
the training get done is by the chief pilot. Uh, he or she goes out into the field with, with their subordinate pilots, does a night operations training session, follows the syllabus in the manuals, tick, 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 signs them off, makes a note of who's approved for flight night, and that's it, it's done. The procedures to fly at night are in the manuals, like doing a job safety assessment and a risk assessment during the day and all that mumbo jumbo. But there is no night ops endorsement where you've got to come to one of us flight schools and be signed off. Um, it, 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 yeah, it's, it's, it's given to every REOC holder. So I, I was getting lots of calls and emails going, hey, do you guys do the night ops endorsement? I'm like, Hang on, you've got it on your REOC already. You don't, you don't need me for that. Um, so have a look in your REOC. You'll see that night ops is there. There's an instrument that should be in your manuals, whoever created your manuals. Um, if it's us, we certainly include it. In those manuals is the night ops instrument that allows your REOC to take advantage of flying at night without any further requirements from any training schools or applications into CASA, so to speak. Just follow the procedure. If you've got questions on the night ops, let me know and I can, I'll either do another video or I can send you back some information. And it's, it's quite simple. It's not that hard, to be honest. That's night ops out the way, cool. New manual template has just been released from the regulator. So um, there's a new manual template out now. As you know, up until this point, if you've come through us, we've always used the two document system, your manuals and your procedures, and we can still use that. That can still be used, no problem. Um, however, the new manual has been released. It's one document and it coincides with CASA's new release of um, significant and insignificant changes. So what used to confuse a lot of people back in the early days is what you were allowed to change in your manuals and what you couldn't change in your manuals. And so CASA have sort of tried to get this nice and simplified now that you can change a bunch of stuff, um, but it'll fall into two categories, significant and non-significant changes. And, the, and it, it's, there's descriptions in the MOS about what is what what's a significant change and there's there's a whole bunch of stuff i won't go through them here but again go and look in the manual standards or I'll, I'll, i might even put some in the description below um what constitutes a significant change and then you send that into casa and bob's your uncle insignificant changes you still got to send into casa but they won't review it and they won't look at it and go oh you've got to change this you've got to change that um, they'll just put it on file and there's a record of it happening i guess you do the same thing you update your um your uh, revision log to what was changed and blah, blah, blah. Part of that new manual, though, comes with a very significant change in the fact that less than two kilogram operations that are out, uh, stays within the standard operating conditions, um, where you don't need an official approval of any sort, you no longer need to do a job safety assessment. So just to touch that again, if I'm flying, say, a Phantom or a Mavic, and I'm in standard operating conditions, that is outside three nautical miles, you know, not above 400 feet, not at night, all that normal standard operating conditions that are in regulation and, and you can find them pretty easy, then I don't need to do a JSA. Um, that's in the manuals, that's part of the new manuals. If you've got questions about that new manual template or if you want to take advantage of that, um, then hit me up. Uh, we, we still, look, we still do the job safety assessment on everything we do. I mean. We only do training, I guess, and, and, and demonstrations and consultation, but uh, even if we are only flying a little drone, we still do the job safety assessment. I like a paper trail. I like to know what my boys are doing. Uh, I like to be able to look back and go, hey, what's that? And, and you know, that's just me. I know there are very large organisations that would never send a drone out without a JSA. The JSA is just one piece of paperwork that some of the large organisations have to do. So anyway, if you've got questions about that, hit me up for that. Um, the other change to, uh, or as well, to the manuals is we're now able to remove the serial numbers and call signs or not include serial numbers and call signs on uh, in our Schedule 1. You know how we've gone to the registration system now where all our drones are registered. And for those with a REOC, you have Schedule 1 and you've got, um, you know, you put your M300 and, you know, what it weighs and a call sign or its serial number at the end, you know big long serial number from DJI or you call it you know FPV Oz Mavic 1 or whatever it is you've got that's gone now now uh, under with the new manual again and you can adopt it into your existing manuals or just need to we just need to go through CASA to do it and anyway change some things but anyway the point being we now just list the model of the drone and what it weighs and that's it so as long as it's on your REOC in other words if, if you've got a, uh, a 25 kilo REOC and you've got an M300 on it, for example, and you go and buy an M600, 
you now only need to list M600 and it's maximum taken offline. No longer do you need uh, the serial number. And if you add a second M600, you haven't got to do anything because the M600 is already on the Schedule 1 as being that type of aircraft already listed. So that's pretty cool. Wow, that was a mouthful. There's lots of stuff happening still. Lots of stuff coming. Um, the automated airspace trial is still rolling. If I've forgotten anything that, that's come up, uh, I, had a, I had a bit of a head scratcher before I started this video. And like most things, none of this is scripted. I, you know, I'm shooting from the hip here. I think I've covered everything. Um, uh, the close proximity, I, I should mention that. Close proximity, uh, I, we've managed to get close proximity operations down to one meter for a number of clients now. So if that's something that interests you, like you want to get a small drone really close to a, to a, a, a third party, in other words, not your crew, an actor or a, a participant of some sort, um, then come and see us. We got, we've got down to one meter now. There are sort of you know, strict controls and guidelines, but it's there. So that's, that's exciting. We, we've got that through. Um, lots of other stuff happening and changing. Um, the, the usual ways to contact us, look, if you want to get in touch with us, here's all the details coming up now. Our central email box has not changed. There it is on the screen, training at fpvaustralia.com.au. Our 1300 number is still the same. I can never remember it. Three, I won't say it because I'll probably get it wrong, but it's on, <laughs> it's on the screen. Um, you can go to our website, fpvaustralia.com.au and hit us up there. Uh, there's plenty of ways of getting in touch with us. Don't be shy to ask questions. That's what we are here for. Anyway, that's that. Let me know uh, if you need anything. Remember, as I always say, if you're flying a drone today, tomorrow, next week, or next month, please do so safely and responsibly. Enjoy. <laughs> Thank you.